After weeks of being held captive by mercenaries, Judith de Moreda stepped off the creaky deck of the French ship Santa Catarina in 1654 and onto the muddy streets of New Amsterdam. Relief washed over her like new rain. To be sure, the town was smaller, smellier, and less orderly than she was used to, but the air was also cooler than it had been in her most recent home in Recife, Brazil. More crucially, allies awaited her and the rest of the Jewish castaways. Prior to the arrival of the Santa Catarina, however, there were not any Jewish women in the colonial town, or even a minion of men. Now, suddenly, there were four more men and their wives, 13 children and two single women, Judith de Moreira and Risha Nones. It was early September, and the new year was upon Judith. The reprieve was short-lived. Rosh Hashanah had started earlier that year, but already God's judgment seemed against her. The day before the holiday started, Judith learned that the Dutch colonial court had ruled that her few remaining possessions would be sold to meet her and her fellow passengers' debt. Judith had been able to pay less than the others, with the few coins that had survived her travels. Thus, her possessions were among the first to be sold. Judah's story is a poignant reminder of how the saga of Jewish women in early New York begins with the troubled history of the things they owned. Her story reminds us of the holes in that narrative, as if a silverfish or greedy moth had feasted upon the past. The records do not tell us, for example, what Judith was forced to sell, perhaps clothing and bedding, or a small memento of her previous lives as a Jewish woman in the Caribbean and Amsterdam. Or maybe it was a relic of the more distant past, of the years her ancestors had spent hiding Jewish practices from the Iberian Inquisition's steely gaze. Whatever the objects were, they would no longer be hers. All she owned was sold to pay strangers a debt she had not asked to accrue. Judith's pattern of brief appearance and subsequent silence in the written records haunts the history of Jewish women over the next two centuries. Although a wide range of scholars have written about Jewish women from the 1880s onwards, Discussions of Jewish women from before 1850 remain rare. In The Art of the Jewish Family, I argue that, in order to examine the full range of Jewish women's lives in early America, we need to expand our definition of evidence and listen to the silences in the archive. What were the structural reasons women were less likely to create documents? What textual and non-textual sources did women in this era create and use? What forces kept these sources out of the archives and silenced early Jewish women's lives in later histories? By thinking about archiving as an act and an ongoing process, I suggest that current stories told about Jews in early America are skewed. Expanding our evidence and listening to silences shifts their focus of Jewish identity out of the synagogue and the political arena and into the familial sphere. In order to rethink early Jewish women's lives, the Art of the Jewish Family examines five objects owned by Jewish women who lived at least a portion of their lives in early New York between 1750 and 1850. Each chapter creates a biography of a single woman through her object, but also uses her story to shed light on larger changes in Jewish women's lives. The women I discuss are diverse, some rich, some poor, some Sephardi, some Ashkenazi, some born enslaved, some who were slave owners themselves. In creating these biographies, I propose a new methodology for early American Jewish women's history, one that could be applied to other areas in Jewish history for which records are sparse. This method looks at both material objects and fragmentation as important evidence for understanding the past. What social and religious structures, I ask, caused early Jewish women 
to disappear from the archives.